We are the Institute for the Study of the Intelligent Community here at Walsh University. We have been working with a global think tank anchored in New York City called the Intelligent Community Forum for three years. Two years ago, we established this institute, the first of its kind to put legs on the ground for this organization, and last year we had our first symposium. So we follow through with today after hearing the challenge and the hopeful solutions that were offered by our three thought leaders, and we move to the promise. Sunit Singh Thule, the founder and CEO of DataWin Limited, responsible for its overall vision, its strategy, and execution. He has 23 years of experience as a serial entrepreneur, having previously launched two successful companies that conducted initial public offerings on the NASDAQ stock market. At DataWind and previous ventures, patented technologies were created to develop scanning, printing, and imaging products that set world records in both price and performance, and have received numerous awards and accolades, including recognition by the Guinness Book of Records. Most recently, DataWind's tablets have received worldwide attention as the company executes a vision to empower the next three billion people with computing and internet access. On November 28, 2012, DataWind's Akash 2 tablet computer was launched at the United Nations by the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Sunit has been recognized by Forbes magazine in 2012 Impact 15 list as a classroom revolutionary using innovative technologies to reinvent education globally. He has also been recognized as the Entrepreneur of the Year for 2012 by the World Seek Awards. DataWind has received many awards, including UK's Most Innovative Mobile Company for 2012 by UK Trade and Investment, and the Technology Achievement Award by the Indo-Canadian Chamber of Commerce. In addition to speaking at numerous universities, Sunit has also spoken at the Internet Freedom Conference in Stockholm, the Beyond Access Conference in Washington, D.C., and the Digital World Conference in Dhaka. Please welcome our 2013 Global Symposium keynote presenter, Sunit Singh Thule. I'm truly, truly honored and humbled um, to be here uh, to have you uh, to allow me the opportunity to tell you my story, what we're doing, and, and the fun we're having doing it. Um, my family generally refers to me as an optimist, and I don't believe that that's necessarily my nature except when I sit through the kind of stuff I've sat through this morning, you, you have no choice but to be an optimist. I, I have great hope for humanity, uh, and, and I believe the kind of people we saw this morning and the kind of work that they're doing, and the kind of people that have had the opportunity to interact with in the audience uh, make you truly believe this great hope for humanity. Uh, I, I just think that there's no room for pessimists left in this world. What we're doing, though, on our end is, is very simple, but we get credited with a lot more than that. Um, and I'll lead you through our story, the motivation behind what we're doing and, and the, the results we're starting to see. In the simplest of terms, all we're doing is making low-cost tablet computers. There's hundreds of companies that do that, hundreds of companies. And there are a bunch of iPads also around and on, on most tables around. But what I'd like to do is just take a couple of these devices, and if I could just ask that you just pass them around and get a sense of the products. Um, if I could pass them to Jack. I, I read a study a few years ago that, that really made an impact to, on me. And then the interaction with my kids over the years, and I remember watching them watch a video on YouTube that, that sort of hit home to some degree. 
that started us on this journey. There's a, been a bit of discussion this morning about connecting. I was born in India, uh, moved out of India at the age of eight, ended up in northern Canada at the age of 11, um, and you know, always had a link back with India. That was how I was connected to India. Uh, I'm excited to hear the effort that Walsh University is making in Uganda. Um, you don't have to be born in Uganda to want to be connected and make an impact in Uganda. And, and I think that, that the kind of effort that they're making is the kind of effort that makes me believe that the future of humanity is positive. So I saw this, this study that talked about the fact that India has about 220 million students. And then they did some modeling around it and they said, well, let's start looking at how many kids drop out of school at different age groups. Grades five to eight, 43% of the kids drop out of school. 43% grades five to eight. Grades nine to 12, 68%. And that's a, they extrapolated that and they said, if that's the case, how many kids out there are not in school? Because you know, that's not the kind of figure that the Indian government or Indians wanting to feel proud of India would ever want to highlight, but that number comes to about 360 million. Can you imagine 140 million kids that are not in school? I saw my kids watching this video and even though it's in Hindi, you'll get the sense of it. They had searched on YouTube, Indian teacher funny, and you know, it's like the waving cat or the you know, other kind of videos you get on YouTube. There's a genre on YouTube, but Indian teacher funny. So Indian media likes to take camera crews, go out into the villages and quiz teachers. And you get a whole bunch of these videos on YouTube about Indian teacher funny. So if we could just play that video, please. Sunday, Apple or mango ki spelling और ये जनवरी फरवरी किस चिड़िया का नाम है मैडम से सीख लीजिए मैडम को संडे की स्पेलिंग नहीं आती संडे का स्पेलिंग क्या पढ़ाती हैं संडे का S A N D E संडे रविवार So as my kids watched that giggling away I actually found it pretty sad um, one, uh, I, I was born in India. I spent the early part of my life in India, so, so I felt embarrassed. Second, I didn't think it was right to embarrass anybody in national TV, so that I didn't like. And then the realization that potentially millions and millions and millions of kids get relegated to that quality education. And it's not that the teachers want to provide that quality education or the parents are willing to accept that quality education. That's what they have to accept. And to understand why, that the ca why that's the case, one looks at the studies done by a fellow by the name of Professor Sugata Mitra. And if you're not familiar with him, I'd recommend going to YouTube and searching hole in the wall experiments. He's done these very interesting experiments. In fact, the current issue of Wired Magazine has a front cover story, it's in my bag, um, <laughs> has a front cover story talking about uh, the results of one of his experiments uh, in, in Mexico. And what he showed was he took a standard math test and started giving it to kids around New Delhi. And he saw that the average was around 68%. And then he went out 50 miles outside of New Delhi and gave the same test and went 100 miles outside of New Delhi and 200 miles outside of New Delhi and 250 miles outside of New Delhi. By the time he got to about actually 250 kilometers outside of New Delhi, he was that far out from any large metropolitan city, the same test was generating results in the teens in percentages. And what he was trying to show was that good quality teachers don't end up in these remote areas. 70% of India, about a billion people, live in a part of the parts of the country that don't have paved roads. 
There are no malls, there are issues with electricity, there are lawlessness issues, and so on, and so on, and so on. And good quality teachers end up near the big cities. They don't end up in these places. And that's why camera crews have the opportunity to go in there and quiz teachers and, and embarrass them on national TV. And if you can afford it, you migrate closer to a big city. And if you can't afford it, you end up in those places and you get relegated to that quality education. The discovery that the quality of education that you receive in most of the world is directly linked to your economic class was very obvious to me. In, in India, before I'd left at the age of eight, when we used to play in the yard, the kids that you'd play marbles with, we didn't have a sense of economic class. You know, nobody questioned, is this uh, the gardener's kid, or is this the cook's kid, or is this the driver's kid, and so on. Uh, we weren't any special. This was just a standard average middle class family in India. Um, but as I grew up, and I'd make those visits back to India every three or four years, and see those friends grow up and where they ended up in life, the only real difference was the quality education we received. And the quality of education we, each of us received was very directly linked to our economic class. And over the years, we thought about, you know, how do you solve that? How do you find a solution to that? And we decided that computing internet access is the way that links the world. And, and you know, I, I can go off into tangents of the kind of areas that it has an impact, but it's without question uh, that, if that, you know, if that's something that gets, uh, that somebody wants to argue, I mean, I, I can spend days and days. I remember I was at uh, the Internet Freedom Conference in Sweden, and there was a professor from, um, I forget, uh, some sub-Saharan African country, um, and he said, well, you know, this whole idea, internet freedom, doesn't apply to where we are. We got these 32 other problems that need to be solved before you get there. Until we have democracy and the freedom to speak and the freedom uh, to exercise our religion and so on and so on, uh, freedom of the internet is, is an irrelevant kind of thing. And I thought to myself, it's, uh, you know, I said, you're wrong. You're so wrong. We've seen the internet help overthrow a dictator in Egypt with the Arab Spring. Nobody from Silicon Valley is going to come down and try to figure out the problems that exist in many of these parts of the world. We've got to figure out how to educate the kids in these parts of the world, connect them to the world, and the internet will allow them to get educated to a level that allows them to find solutions to the kind of problems they face. And we decided that that's what needs to happen, not from a philanthropic perspective, uh, not from, you know, let me go donate a bunch of computers to somebody. Uh, and we tried that, didn't find that as effective as we'd like it to be. We decided that for it to scale, it needed to be a business and it needed to be a profitable business that would work in those parts of the world. And why it's important, especially in education, is that the amount of time it's going to take to train enough teachers and build enough infrastructure in a place like India and a number of these other places, we're going to lose multiple generations. And we need to resolve those issues with a level of impatience that unfortunately doesn't exist yet. So the belief was that flipped classroom type teaching models where kids could learn from videos from the best quality teachers that exist in the world uh, to give them the base that they need and changing teachers from lectures to coaches um, would, would be impactful. And we, as we watched uh, and, and read research by Professor Sugata Mitra and, and looked at some of the other stuff that was going on, believed even more and more that that is the solution, that the, 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 that can impact. Um, and it requires a computer or a tablet in every child's home, every child's hands. People ask me often, you know, so what's the right age to get started, you know, to get exposed to computers and internet and so on? I see today parents using them as pacifiers. I, I can't imagine that there's any age that's too early. 
you know, it's, it's, it's like the mistake I made with my youngest child. I forgot to teach him how to hold a pencil and started kindergarten and discovered that we'd forgotten to teach him anything because the first one you make your effort on, the second one a little less, the third one a little less. And by the time we got to the fourth one, we thought, he'll figure it out. Um, and he ended up in kind kindergarten, couldn't hold a pencil. And we had to teach him his alphabet by tracing it on a tablet with his fingers before he developed the mechanical skills to be able to hold and, and write with a pencil. I don't think that there's any age that is too young. And it's not about computer lab. It's about a blended learning environment to empower a better quality of education. Why affordability matters? There are a lot of barriers. There are dictators that don't want the internet to be connected. There are other issues in many parts of the world. Uh, if you watch any of the news recently about uh, Malala Yousafzai uh, from the Swat Valley in, in Pakistan, there are people that take girls off of school buses and shoot them in the head because they want to go to school. That's the unfortunate world that we live in. And when I think of that, I think, you know, if I was in that environment, and no matter how much I believe in education, would I send my daughter to school? And to be honest, I wouldn't. I value her life or my daughter's lives much more than anything else. But until security issues get solved, maybe internet access at home can empower them in a way that isn't being done currently. If you Google me, you'll see that I'm one of the most controversial figures in India these days, uh, probably more than the average politician. Uh, and, and sometimes it makes me wonder why. Um, and and I, I can do a whole different presentation on why. But, but uh, there are many people that have written very strong articles uh, and op-ed pieces and national papers in that environment why they think that this is the wrong way to go. And some of them have argued that a country that uh, can't deliver clean drinking water to its citizens should it be focused on trying to deliver tablets for education. We believe education is the most important thing before you solve anything else. If you solve that, the rest of them, it follows. We don't believe that electricity is the barrier and we don't believe that network access is the real barrier. When you look at internet adoption and cell phone adoption in the West, it was, it's generally been about a 30% differential. Countries that have 100% cell phone penetration have 70% broadband penetration. It's that kind of a difference. When you look at India, you have 900 million people that have access to cell phones, that use cell phones, and there are 13 million broadband connections. 900 million versus 13 million. Why is that gap there? When you look at global adoption of cell phones versus global adoption of internet, and, and as that chart sort of shows, as that expanded beyond the richer developed world, that gap started to increase, and today that gap is about three billion people. So three billion people in the world have access to cell phones. They have figured out how to charge their cell phones. They have access to some form of a network to talk on those cell phones but they don't have access to the internet. And I asked the question, you know, is if you're, desert, if you're stranded on a deserted island, cell phone or internet, what do you choose? And when I ask engineering classes in universities, internet without question. I've, I don't think I've ever had one that has said cell phone. When I ask as MBA classes, you get some that do cell phone, and I say you're failed and I just Ask, ask him to leave. Because the internet encompasses the cell phone. You know, the in internet encompasses Skype and other forms of communication. It encompasses everything you, you can do. And until th they come and rescue you off that island to figure out which berries are good to eat and which are not, you need the internet for that too. So why, does, why do three billion people not have internet access? And it's not literacy. It's not electricity. It's not network access, it's about affordability. When the cell phone got down to $20 and $30 in the Indian environment, 
the guy who drove a rickshaw in the hot Indian sun decided he could afford it. It was useful for him from a security perspective. His family could find him when they needed to find him. He printed up little pieces of paper with his number on there and handed out to people in the community and said, hey, I'm your local rickshaw wala and you can come call me when you need to. So it helped commerce. It was affordable. In fact, in the early years, I remember people would ask the question in a country like India where there's 30 million landline phones out of 1.2 billion people, who's going to teach them how to use a cell phone? You're never going to get big adoption of cell phones because they're never going to be able to figure out how to use a cell phone. 900 million people and 38 billionaires that that industry created in the last 10 years, uh, they've been proven wrong. So we believe that if we can resolve the issue of affordability, resolve the issue of cost, that internet adoption will pay, take the same path. The question is, so what's the right cost? What's the right price for a computer and internet access? And where do you need that to be? So we did a study internally, and we looked at the US market and tried to look at what the cost was at different times in the adoption of the PC and when it really took off. And we discovered that in about 98 and 99, PCs really took off in the US when the average cost of a PC dropped below 1,000 bucks and for the target customer, it was a week of salary or less. We said, that's it. That's our answer. We've got to figure out in the part of the world we want to focus on for our target customer, how do we get to a week of salary? Now, India has 1.2 billion people. A week of salary for some people is a million bucks a week. And for some people, it's the other extreme also. So, so we did a study. We looked at the different economic classes, and we, we broke them up. And that sort of pyramid I generated from Excel. And what happens is that the so-called rich, those that have above a $2,500 a month income, uh, there's 16 million of those, and, and that out of the 1.2 billion becomes such a small dot that you don't see it. So the pyramid, that's why it shows only three, not, not four. There is a fourth one up there. But to get to the bottom two layers, to get to that billion people, we discovered that the right price point has to be below 50 bucks. We've got to figure out how we can create computers below $50 and be able to deliver them profitably and scale that as a business if we want computing internet access to grow. And it wasn't just for the sake of the benefit it would create. This is a for-profit venture. We wanted to figure out how to go after a market that Apple and Samsung weren't going to go after that had potential and find what barrier existed for that market and resolve that barrier. So we tried and started focusing on how to create $50 and sub $50 devices. To do that, uh, a number of things happened over the years that, that actually helped us get to where, where we got to. Uh, Google happened. Uh, Google decided that the world will move to a mobile environment and decided that they wanted to create an operating system out there for it decided they wanted to make money off of advertising, and decided they'd give the operating system for free, and uh, they'd like let anybody make chips on that operating system. So while we were used to just Intel and AMD making CPUs, but three years ago, 200 different companies started making chips around the ARM architecture. The first iPad used a microprocessor that cost Apple about $35. We use the same caliber microprocessor today, it costs us two and a half bucks. So that was nothing to do with us. That just Google happened to that industry. Today, the most expensive part of these devices that you've got uh, that are going around here are the touch screens and the LCDs. And we used to make a product we used to sell in the UK called the Pocket Surfer a few years ago. And about four years ago, the supplier that was supplying that to us went bust. And as they went bust, we went around to everybody else and said, hey, by the way, we like these, and we are a prominent manufacturer in the UK, and we're selling 50,000 of these a year. And they looked at us and said, oh, we don't get out of bed for 50,000 a year. Um, and nobody would make these touch screens or LCDs for us. So we thought, hey, how tough can that be? Um, and we started trying to make LCDs and touch screens. 
And not only did we create our own LCDs and touch screens, what we discovered was that the margin in them is outrageously large. Today, in a million unit quantity, a seven inch multi-touch projective capacitive touch screen, five points, out of China costs you 11 bucks. Our manufacturing cost for that is two and a half dollars. It's not that we do it cheaper than the Chinese. They probably make it for two bucks, who knows? But the demand for that is so high that the market sustains that margin. And if we were smart, we'd just say, hey, let's get in the touchscreen business and go sell a bunch of touchscreens, except we decided that the market and that gap will go away, right? Whenever you have this kind of disparity, then a bunch of guys come in, try to create that, um, and that margin goes away. Surprisingly, three years later, that margin hasn't gone away yet. But we decided that we would get rid of that margin, try to make a less expensive device, and put that out to market. And so we give away that margin, in essence, by trying to create lower cost devices in the LCDs and the, the touch screens that we manufacture. And we don't make them in China, nothing wrong with making them in China. We actually assemble them in uh, our products in China. We make them in Montreal and we ship them to China for assembly for, for the finished product. The, the question always comes up, as you do this, you know, is it good enough? If you, if you were any one of my competitors and you were pitching a customer that I was pitching to, you would go in and you'd say, come on, what do you expect for 35 or 40 bucks? You can't expect much for, or anything for that. Um, the Los Angeles School District just ran an RFP recently, um, and they have a budget for $700 a unit, a billion dollars. So I went in there, I pitched them my, my standard spiel that I do, and they said, great, except Sunit, we have $700 a unit budget. So now try to figure out what you can do for 700 bucks. We appreciate the $40 option, but, but, uh, but uh, we've got $700 to work with. And don't think it's, it's uh, you know, everywhere in the U.S. they have $700 budgets. Compton, right next door to them, have, has no budget at all. They don't have budgets for the school books, let alone for tablets of 700 bucks a piece. For us, optimizing design for our target market was very important. You can't find a tablet you walk into Best Buy without an HDMI port. Right? My target customer doesn't have TVs with HDMI ports, so I don't put HDMI ports in them. You can't find a tablet without Bluetooth. My entry-level tablets don't have Bluetooth in there. So while these may be 20 cent and 30 cent incremental costs, they have a cascading effect in the overall costs and in our company, we have regular fights and arguments about those kinds of 20 cents and 30 cent features. So just picture this in your mind, somebody in Punjabi language screaming up and down and we're waving our arms and having a big fight over a 20 cent increment in the cost. We design with that kind of a mentality because we know that the customer we're going after is impacted by those kind of price levels. The question is, is it good enough? And somebody asked me, so what's the real innovation? You, you, you get up on all of these places, you, you've been getting an audience with a bunch of world leaders, and, and the UN Secretary General is launching your product at the UN. There's no innovation. All you're doing is making a cheap device. I said, well, the innovation is in the good enough. It's the disruption of the good enough. Nobody sees that three billion person market. And do you want to know the, the, how I know they don't see it? Last week, Microsoft just spent $40 billion buying back their own shares, the, the, the money that they didn't know what to do with, and they bought back their own shares. Guess what? You can equip every student in the world with one of these devices with the same $40 billion. Apple's sitting on $150 billion that they don't know what to do with, right? So if they believed that this was real, owning the internet for the future by making sure that every student grows up with your technology you'd think would be a great marketing ploy. They don't see it and they don't believe it. And their legacy business makes it very difficult for them to go down that direction. Because you wouldn't buy the $500 version of their product if there's a $50 version out there, irrespective of what the features were. Professor Clayton Christensen at Harvard came up with this chart 
and I just plotted us on that chart. And what he's shown is that if you look at the performance requirements of the high end of the market and the performance requirements of the low end of the market, sooner or later, even the low end product exceeds the performance requirements of the high end market. It may not ever hit the performance of the high end product. You know, 10x price differential, you can always perform better by spending 10 times more money. But it's not about beating the features of the iPad. It is meeting and beating the expectations of the customer that you're targeting. When the first iPad came out, it was a Cortex A8 one gig processor with 256 megabytes of RAM. And our very first version of the product was a 366 megahertz processor with 256 megabytes of RAM. Uh, and maybe arguably it didn't meet the performance requirements of the entry level customer. The second version though went up to a Cortex A8 1 gig processor with 512 megabytes of RAM. Double the RAM and the same level of processor as the original iPad. Is the horsepower of the original iPad good enough? I've delivered 100,000 of those to the Indian government at around $40, out of which I've been paid about 36 so far. Um, that, that's, that's a separate story. <laughs> um, the iPad continued to increase in performance. It went to a gig dual core processor and 512 RAM. The iPad 3 uh, incre increased the RAM to a gigabyte. And the current iPad is a 1.3 gig dual core processor and a gig of RAM. And in the next few weeks, uh, the next version of, of the entry level device for the Indian government will be out. Uh, we will supply that to them for a little under 45 bucks, uh, which will be a 1.5 gig dual core processor and a gig of RAM. There's a brand difference. There's certainly a build quality and design difference. Uh, there is a difference in screen resolution, camera resolution. But the core horsepower to be able to deliver the kind of applications that you need to on these devices is good enough. And that was our focus to try to get to what is good enough for that target customer. And the result is that even in the US, we will offer the entry level device at $37.99, and it's gotta be something 99, right? Um, <laughs> that'll have the same level of performance as the original iPad, so that if the schools in Compton can't afford iPads, that they have another solution. But it's not just about the low cost device. It's about delivering the internet. To us, that's the big area of focus uh, and that's the big area of research uh, for us. If you look at the Indian environment, uh, 30, 40 million landline phones in a country of 1.2 billion people, they're never gonna have enough landline infrastructure to be able to meet the requirements. So broadband is very, very problematic in that environment. And the mobile networks are utterly congested. They're so badly congested that the average person uh, has to carry two phones, uh, sometimes three. Generally, you have two phones and both of them are dual SIMs, so that means you're on four networks at any one time, uh, just so that you get coverage in one of the four, uh, even in major cities like New Delhi and Mumbai. So we created a technology on which, and I won't spend a lot of time explaining this, but on which we received 18 US patents, a number of international patents, that reduces the size of the page by factors of 30x. So if you think of the CNN page, about a megabyte and a half in size, we reduce it to 30, 40 kilobytes, while the look field functionality stays the same. When you reduce it by such a huge factor, it has two benefits. First is, it can go through faster on a smaller pipe. It takes a lot less data to send across. And second is, your costs go down the cost of internet access goes down. In fact, what we discovered was that the cost goes down so significantly that for the same amount of usage, we can generate more in advertising revenue than we can, uh, than, the amount of, than what the data costs us. And so the vision is to ultimately deliver free basic internet access. And free is never free. You know, somebody is paying for it. Google delivers search for free. Google makes more money than all of the Indian wireless operators put together delivering free search. So we said that makes a lot more sense than trying to figure out 
how we're going to collect two bucks and three bucks on a monthly basis from individual users. And to us, one of the other aspects that was very important was the realization that between the cost of manufacture and the customer price, generally there's a 3x multiple. If you make something for 50 bucks, you add $30 of your own margin on it. You made all the effort, did all the R&D. You don't want to sell it for 52 bucks. You don't crazy like those guys up from Toronto, right? Uh, that's where I live. Um, uh, you, you want to make 30 bucks on it, and then you give it to your distributor, and the distributor who just bought it for 80 bucks adds his 30 bucks on it, and he's at 110, and then Best Buy or Radio Shack or whoever's the retailer that's going to sell it adds his margin on it, and you are at 150 bucks. We said, well, but our customer is so price sensitive that you can't focus on margins in that manner. And on the hardware side, what happens if we erase our margin down to almost nothing? And they said, you can't do that. He said, of course you can, because the big companies are already doing it. Amazon sells the Kindle Fire for $199, costs them 240 bucks to make it. Why do they sell for about $40 less than what it costs them to make it? Because they know that the average user will use enough, download enough books within the first three or four months, they'll make up that difference. It doesn't matter. We can't afford to lose money on hardware, so we make a little bit on hardware, but we, we don't focus ourselves just on hardware. Hardware and hardware-related revenue streams for us are less than a quarter of our total bottom line. We make money on network services, content apps, and advertising. And that becomes even more important. And we do direct-to-consumer. We don't go through multiple tiers of channel. We just do direct-to-consumer. If anybody doesn't believe that that model works, Amazon is proof that that model works. There's a significant portion of the population that is willing to buy directly off of catalogs and phone, home shopping and, and, and the, the internet and even in the Indian environment, surprisingly even in the Indian environment. So we decided we would go after customers in two ways. One is we would evangelize governments and others that broad scale deployment of technology can be impactful. Second is we figure out how to generate public awareness of our solutions, and we just offer them directly to the consumer. And we'll eliminate multiple tiers of margin that exist in that environment. And we'll focus on the recurring revenue stream. We'll, we'll consider a relationship with the customer over a couple of years instead of just having bought a product and that's where the relationship ends. The free usage model is very important for us, and, and we believe we can generate enough tiers of value-added services to actually offer that. And we're going to experiment before the end of this year in India. So the entry-level devices you'd be able to buy, including duties and taxes, in the $50, $60 price point. But basic internet access will cost you nothing on top of that. We're going to try experimenting that even in the US sometime next year uh, at about $20 a year for basic browsing. Um, and see if we can bundle that into the cost of the hardware and see what kind of reaction we get. The idea is to offset $20 worth of data costs through advertising, buck and a half a month of uh, advertising. We realize hardware is one aspect, internet access is another aspect, content and apps is a very important aspect. All the content and apps that got created got created for a different customer. But our customer isn't somebody who's uh, you know, traditionally been on the internet. So you've got to think of different kinds of apps, and you've got to try to figure out what kind of content will be appropriate for that customer. So we decided we'd start launching contests. So we partnered with the United Nations, and we did a global call for socially responsible apps that would empower women, and got almost a negligible response. OK, interesting. Who cares? And we said, no, 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 we got to explain. This is not for charity. There's a huge money-making opportunity, and we got to figure out how to get to, to people that would be entrepreneurial and realize that lots of these are going to go out. The next three billion people are going to get on the internet, and the opportunity isn't going to be the guy making the devices. You know, you don't think of, remember, Gateway and e-machines and Compaq and so on? It's, it's Microsoft and Google, and the guys that own the platform, that own the customer relationship, are the guys that, that really own the business. So that's where the opportunity is. 
So we decided what we'd start doing is continue along that and start doing hackathons. Get universities engaged, get students engaged, uh, do collaborations between universities in different parts of the world, teach kids how to code, and come in, inspire them about the opportunity, not from the social good perspective, but from the opportunity perspective, and see what happens. In fact, there's a hackathon coming up uh, uh, next weekend in Mountain View. Uh, the reason we wanted to do some hackathons in Silicon Valley is getting across this barrier of is it good enough? And we'll have a couple hundred kids, we'll teach them how to code over a few days, and uh, then they're going to try to develop apps. And we're working with the universities and others in different parts of the world to, to think from that perspective also. And the kind of deployments we're starting to see are all over the place. Afghanistan, Pakistan, we're working with an NGO that, that is training 15,000 midwives in Afghanistan uh, using this as a, as a tool. Uh, we did, an, did a contest in India, and the challenge we posed to these students was, if you have a guy who sells fruits and vegetables on a cart, fruit wala in, in Indian terminology, uh, who has very minimal levels of literacy skills, has some numeracy skills, can you justify this as a commerce tool for them? So you've got to create a application that has such a rich graphical user interface that they can use it without having great literacy skills. And the student group that won that contest created an app and has started deploying that app where these guys take pictures of the, the produce they have, they click on a number to decide how many they have, they're linked back to a guy who supplies them the product, and they created a full point-of-sale terminal where they're able to give credit to their customers. They take a picture of the customer, they type in his phone number, and, and so on. I mean, it's just a relatively complete point-of-sale terminal um, that's sold as a solution with the piece of hardware for about 70 bucks um, to fruit wallas. And they've discovered an application in an area that they will have no competition for a very, very long time to come. I have a friend at uh, Harvard who supports a girls' school in Uganda, and she said, you know, I want to figure out how to get some computers in Uganda. Would you donate some computers? I said, well, I'd donate some tablets if we figure out how to teach them how to code. To me, it's not just let's donate some computers. Let's figure out, let's show them how to code. And so the Grace Villa School for Girls, Home for Girls in northern Uganda, teaches coding and as field reporters that go around with tablets and you don't know how empowering it is to be able to take a video and write something and put it out on the internet and know that there's nobody between you and potentially billions of people who would read what you've just written. We think that that's very powerful. We started in the Indian market uh, Initially, the Indian government at the end of 2011 announced this project, and we were very lucky that they agreed that this kind of adoption, this kind of deployment needed to happen. The market was 250,000 units a year, 80% owned by Samsung and Apple. And uh, generally, what the rest of the industry does is they fight over the remaining 20%. You're not going to offset Samsung or Apple in any part of the world. They're going to own 80% of the market. But our market wasn't their market. Our market was a very different customer than what their market would be. You know, our market is a customer who it would be three months worth of salary to buy an iPad. But we just thought, hey, we're going to try to hit 50,000 units a year in India. We've been in the UK for four or five years. That's what we're doing there. That's the number we're going to do in India, 4,000 units a month. We started to generate so much publicity, so much publicity that it was unimaginable. In fact, I was back in Toronto one day and I got woken up at three in the morning by my guys saying all our websites are down and we've been called by the internet emergency response team uh, uh, from the Department of Telecom saying that you're having massive 
um, denial of service attacks, um, the, the kind of attacks that, you know, if China attacked the U.S. from, a, from an online perspective or if Iran attacked uh, their neighboring country from an online perspective, those kind of attacks. And I thought, oh my God, who have I upset now? Um, and we discovered that it was just people trying to figure out how to get to our websites and how to call us and, and place orders. We generated about four million units of orders before we actually commercially launched the product. And uh, we're now the largest supplier of tablet computers in the Indian market. We're lucky enough that we've been able to convince the Indian government and they've put out a vision that they'd like in the next five to six years to equip every student in the country with a low-cost tablet computer. In fact, when the Poi Thai Party ran for election about two years ago in Thailand, they ran a whole campaign, one tablet per child, and ran big billboards around that campaign. And they were asked in the debates, so who's going to pay for these $500 tablets you want to go hand out to everybody? And said, they said nothing about the 500 bucks. They said, oh, we've decided we're going to get those $35 versions from that funny looking guy that showed up here a few weeks ago. Um, 42 countries around the world are implementing broad scale projects, some with us, some without us, but 42 countries around the world are implementing broad scale projects to equip every student with computing internet access. That's the new arms race, impacting education through computing internet access. And we're lucky to be having a role in that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it was very interesting and enlightening to, to listen to you and, and affordability is the key word in, in the UN's Broadband Commission also. But when we talk about affordability, we talk about affordability to access information, access to, to broadband. I agree that um, there will be availability, but access is the issue and afford, uh, how people can afford it. How do you do it? Um, what's your power to governments to, to, to make them understand that you can make the cheap tablet, you can provide the, the education, the content and the devices, but the governments should make the enab enabling environment for for these investments to, to allow the affordable connection. Because the, the big issue is that uh, the internet might be there, but it's not affordable. And that challenges all the governments. And, and we find out in Broadband Commission that, that the, the mind setting is still so that as much money as we can get from the taxing the broadband, taxing the mobile phone, taxing the uh, infrastructure, thinking that that would make the people happy when you think that actually you should make everything in your power to make less taxes, no taxes, incentives for, for companies to provide the, the affordable connection. So how do you combine the affordability in, in, in devices and, and in access? So, so you're right, uh, you know, th that's a big issue in, in a lot of these places. Um, that is that the governments that live in very limited budgets uh, look at these uh, licensing fees and, and, and uh, royalties that they earn off of broadband uh, licenses that they give out uh, as a budget balancing tool. And we go around, we, we spend a lot of time evangelizing um, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity and the impact. And unfortunately, most of them can't think that far out. You know, when, I, when I'm in India, I, I talk about, um, uh, look, uh, the, the incremental benefit that you have is just this, and the improvement in the GDP when X number of new people get on the internet is so much more, and the ROI is very short-term, and so on, so on. Some of them get it, some of them don't. 
Um, and in the markets we focus on, we continue persevering by trying to convince them, by, sometimes by trying to scare them. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with the education minister of Greece. And he said, yeah, okay, cool. You know, this, we're focused on other things right now. We'll, we'll come back to what you're doing in a few years. We're trying to figure out how to stave, save, stave off bankruptcy for the country. Um, you know, the, and w w this is not a big focus for us. And I explained to them that Turkey just launched the Fatih project, 11.7 million tablets in the next three years, and every student is going to be equipped with it. And if you know any of the background between Turkey and Greece, <laughs> You know, they, they are not always the friendliest of neighbors. And I said, five years from now, you're going to have gone through your austerity measures and the rest of it, and you're going to have stabilized your economy, and you, you, you're going to say, now we can stop cutting back on schools and after-school programs, and, you know, we, we, we don't uh, need to think of all the cutbacks that we've done in the last five years. And you're going to have to compete with a world where those kids have grown up with all of this. I think that similar to what we have in business where we have mentors, in countries you need to have mentors and examples to sh see what's happening. Africa is a prime example. Rwanda has agreed that they will implement a 4G network, LTE, uh, and they will make it accessible to any telecom operator uh, in the next two years. And they want to be the Singapore Africa, right? I want to figure out how do we make Rwanda succeed so well so that every country around there looks at it and says, hey, why not us? Um, I think that's very important. How we were able to do it in, in the Indian environment was we said, look, we said this to the federal government. The, one of the largest operators in India, the third or fourth largest operator, is a company called BSNL, which is the telecom operator, which is the government uh, incumbent operator. 150 million subscribers, and loses a lot of money, right? And we said, you've got all of this network and it's sitting there. And we convinced the government and we convinced BSNL that you've got all this network is just sitting there that has no usage. What if we can guarantee you at least this much usage off of each user? And the only thing is we don't want two gigabyte plans we want 20 megabyte plans. You know, we want to be able to structure it in our own manner. And they did a pilot uh, this summer. And based on the kind of results they received from the pilot, I'm confident that before the end of this year, I will launch free mobile access in India because I've been able to get wholesale data access and parse it in the manner that I want. I, I think the ongoing need to evangelize this is very important. I think the kind of stuff that Carl Bildt does when he talks about internet freedom and, and unrestricted access, I think the kind of work that the ITU does on an ongoing basis to try to convince that these short-term budget balancing things are more detrimental to your economy and your country is necessary, right? Uh, and, and we have to continue doing it. But the moment we get a few cases and points that we can point to in each of these regions, um, in Latin America and South America, I think Uruguay is going to prove that. With the kind of effort that they're making, I think in Africa, Rwanda is going to prove that. Uh, in, in Southeast Asia, I think Thailand is going to prove that. And, and, you, and this is not in 10 years from now. This is in the next two years you're going to start to see you know, real impact from the kind of efforts that they're making. And the moment you start to see that, I think you're going to start to see a different kind of race. Okay. Thank you. That's what we are trying to do in the Broadband Commission. and the. President of Rwanda, Kagame, is the chair of our commission, yeah. so Proves that's, the point. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I think Fantastic. that it's, it's very important for the, yeah. to be an example for the whole world. Um, thanks. That was really, really cool. And when you said um, the coding competitions and learning to code, that's music to my ears. As a business, um, you're in a very interesting position with a very social mission um, as well as in a for-profit company. And so I'm curious how that works in practical terms. I'm a big fan of, I don't just throw technology into my classroom. I want to have reasons why, pedagogical reasons. Do you guys work with teachers in that context and educational systems? 
We do, and, and you know, one of the biggest issues I have is uh, uh, last uh, Christmas Eve, I got woken up to a half-page article on us in the New York Times, right? Should be very happy with a half-page article in the New York Times. But it trashed us. It, it sat there and said, this is a waste of time. They had, a prof they had an assistant professor from the University of Texas who said that there are studies that show that, th that the money can be spent better somewhere else and computing internet access does not positively Im impact the educational environment. And I thought, hang on, what studies is he looking at? And guaranteed, maybe I can find studies the other way around. So I discovered he was looking at a study from 1998, and the average cost of a computer and maintenance of a computer was about 4,000, actually 96, I think, uh, was about $4,000 a year and so on. And, and in an Indian environment where you can pay a teacher $2,000 a year, um, do you want to spend $4,000 on one computer that's going to be obsolete at the end of the year, or do you want to pay for two teachers? I'd pay for two teachers, without, without question. It's not talking about today and $40. So the academic research on the impact that this has is not there at the level that it needs to be. And so we, we do two types of things. One is we work with institutions that teach teachers and try to get them to start thinking from a different perspective and, and, and try to think of a blended learning environment where you're prodding and engaging students in a different kind of way and so on, and to do research. But the research that we need isn't the high school in Canton, Ohio. The high school in Canton, Ohio is like the high school that I went to and, and you know, 78 US patents later, two public companies later, I'm okay with the kind of education that I received. I want to look at the high the school that that video, those kids go to, and I want to show that that's where the impact is. You know, that's the sort of, in my business, the low-hanging fruit. That, that's where the biggest opportunity is. Um, and again, it's not just there. Uh, the reason we did this in Silicon Valley is that there's Palo Alto and there's East Palo Alto. You know, in Los Angeles, there's a Los Angeles school district and then there's Compton. There's enough areas in the U.S. where you can say, hey, can I engage kids with this? Can I get them more interested? Can I make learning fun? Can I, uh, you know, equip them to a better quality education? Because the good quality teachers won't go in some of those places. Right? So, so that's an important area. That kind of academic research is very, very important to be able to do controlled experiments to show, yes, it's useful. I, I run a business. To, for myself, I don't need to do any research. I, I, I asked my, my uh, oldest son recently, who's in the last year of high school, getting ready for university, and I said, you know, I've seen your schools have been doing lots of different kinds of experiments over the last few years. Um, and, and what do you think is the most innovative thing that's happening? And he said, and he thought about it for a few moments, and he said, rewind and pause. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, now they give us lectures on video at the start of the course, uh, and we can watch any of those lectures ahead of time before any class. Uh, and they do less lecturing in class in some of the classes that they're experimenting with these flipped classrooms. And if they're concepts that are taking me a little longer to comprehend, the fact that I can pause it and rewind it, which I couldn't do before uh, off of, you know, the not having those kind of resources, uh, to me that's very impactful. So to me, I, 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 I don't even question the impact it has. I know it has. And I know that there's demand for it, right? So if, if it has a positive impact and I know there's demand for it, that, that's enough of a motivation for me to move forward. When I go try to convince governments and institutions and school boards and the rest of it, then I need to paper it. So, so, so you know, I think, but, but, I, but I think, you know, as we develop better educational pedagogy around it, w we do need to do those studies and, and research. by your achievements, but certainly are in awe of your mission. He brought us um, a few devices with prompts to leverage those uh, to do more and make you proud. Thank you so much for Thank gracing us with being here.